Well, welcome everyone. We're excited that you're here. We know it's a, a busy night on Tuesdays. We, Bear Creek has three sports games going on, and we're excited that you could make it today. I suspect we'll have some more to join us. Um, we have a lot of people here from our own community, as well as guests from outside our community, so welcome. And we have some educators that are joining us tonight as well. So we're glad that you all are here. Um, tonight, um, we are going to be able to get together and hear from our headmaster, Patrick Ruth, and a panel. And our topic is um, Tools for Success, Leading a Tech-Wise Life. One thing at Bear Creek that um, we love is a partnership with parents. And with that, it's exciting to have these events where um, we get to come together and just um, perhaps start our conversation. Um, we're not here, Bear Creek's never here to tell you how to parent, but we're here to partner with you. So tonight, you're not being told how to parent. With that, that means that gives, you free, gives us freedom and our panel freedom to share some of their ideas, maybe some tips from home, because these are just all ideas, right? So you could sit back and just take that all in. One thing that's exciting about Bear Creek is our mission. Everyone around here is passionate about our mission, including parents. Um, our mission provides a high-quality Christian liberal arts education in a nurturing environment that will enable each student to become the individual God intends. My husband and I have three alumni, and it works. <laughs> they are launched through once in college to a, a past college and have a family. So it's exciting to see how this mission is lived out. Um, tonight, you will be hearing from our panel some deans, our um, math, upper school math and science uh, um, head as well as technology specialists here as our counselor in upper school as well. But before we go on, I want to do a little bit of logistics. You will have a lot of information tonight. You can take notes. I know Megan Russell is here. She loves taking notes. You don't have to. I know you do. Because you will receive the PowerPoint. Isn't that amazing? Yes. As well as the recording. So you can, you, Mr. Carruth loves data, and you will see in a moment, there's lots of data. So hopefully you get to sit back and enjoy this time. For those that are new here, we, if you need to use the restroom or anything, you can go out these doors right here or in the back. Easy to get to. And let's see what else. I get to now introduce our headmaster. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing Mr. Carruth um, for 17 years. Lucky for him, he's worked with me as a parent. Loved it so much, I was able to become an employee. My name is Karen Furminger, and I work in admissions as well as in community relations. Um, Patrick um, loves good books like Chesterton and C.S. Lewis, Lewis. He loves hiking, but not as much as his wife Paige does. And he loves football, he loves it, but not as much as Paige, his wife, does. And like I gave you a hint, Mr. Kruth loves data. And I have a feeling he probably loves that even more than Paige loves data. So tonight, let's please welcome Mr. Um, Patrick Kruth. Well, thanks, Karen. And Karen, thanks for putting all this together, for doing such a great job of pulling everything together. We very much appreciate, very much appreciate that. And I am gonna tell you how to raise your kids, so <laughs> we'll make this quick. Um, just teasing, I'm not gonna tell you how to raise your kids. So what we'd like to do tonight is, is basically set the stage for the context of what we're gonna talk about. This is about a, a li living a tech-wise life. Tech is a thing and wisdom is an, an attribute. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And we're gonna contextualize that as well with where your kids probably are. I don't know about you, we were doing mic checks up here and we were all telling our names, where we went to college or high school, when we were born. And I suddenly realized I don't like that number uh, quite as much as I used to. But the world that perhaps, certainly the world I grew up in, maybe the world that you grew up in, is a different world um, than your students are growing up in. So we're going to contextualize some of, that, uh, some of that today. And then we'll jump down into some detail about innovation, AI, good, bad. And um, the panel will obviously come up and give some, some specifics and some tips about how we look at doing that. Good? All right. Great. So let me start with, um, I don't know how many of you have paid attention when you walk in the main building, if you've ever walked in our main building, um, but over the top of it is a stone, and that stone says, it's a small group, anyone, anybody want to tell me what it says? You hate this, I know you hate this when I start going off just <laughs> randomly. All right, it says Credo Utentelegam, 
um, I believe that I may know. And that's, it's written in stone above our um, building when you walk in because it's a foundational principle of the Bear Creek School. And I offer that to you as a foundational principle for what we're going to talk about today. Um, the scriptures are quite clear that as we believe and as we think, so we live and so we do. And so there's always this symbiosis between what we believe, the culture that we're in, and the things that we do. So when we begin to talk about tech, that's just another one of those things that we do uh, that we engage. And it is, it is impacted by how, how what we believe and how we think and the culture around us, but it also feeds back, just like anything else would. I'll tell you a little story. Um, I love the intersection of philosophy and theology. It's why I became a teacher. Um, and one of the people that I have read is a guy named Francis Schaeffer. You may or may not know him. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but he has, a, he has a, a bunch of books. And in one of the books, he gives a metaphor of a Roman bridge. And back in the day, I mean, the Romans are famous for their infrastructure and for their logistics. And so the Roman bridge for thousands of years, people were able to go across that until the context changed. And now if you were to drive a semi-truck over that bridge, it would collapse. The tool and the context... Are, are important and they're interrelated with one another. So in the same way, we're going to talk today about that and about how the context and the tools go together and how they not only feed what we think and what we believe, but we bring our presuppositions and stuff to it. So let me start that. Let me start with uh, one more story, and then we'll, we'll look at some data. I was born in 1968. Exactly. Um, <laughs> And like I said, I don't like that number much anymore. And you know, you know how when you, like when you sign up for something online and they ask for your name and your birthday and you get that little scrolly thing? <laughs> What's up with that? Like I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I actually have the thought, maybe it's not here anymore. <laughs> not good. Don't like that at all. Anyway, so I grew up um, with my first phone was the giant brick phone. When I was in college, I delivered pizzas and in graduate school. So I had the gigantic brick phone that was like, burp, burp, burp. maybe. Um, and then, you know, we moved through. Uh, my favorite phone was the little Motorola flip phone. So we had the Motorola flip phone. And of course, now, as I walked in earlier behind all of you, about three quarters of you were on your phone. Um, so that has become quite a ubiquitous or quite ubiquitous and quite a change from when I was growing up and perhaps when you were growing up as well, from the old brick phone to essentially have being on that thing all the time. Um, I'll show you how many hours a day the next generation or Generation Z is on it, but we are on our phones quite a lot, so it's quite a different context and quite a different world. All right, let's talk a little bit about that. So the, the generation that we're going to talk about today is Gen Z. You can argue with me if you want about what the bandwidth or the scope of that is, but for the most part, it's our students, the students that are in the school right now. I would fall into Gen X. Y'all can place your, yourselves wherever you want to place yourselves, but we're going to do some comparison to look at the context of those. For the most part, these are the students that we're teaching right now. They're your children um, and your students as well. So let's look a little bit at that. A lot of this research I pulled from Barna. Some of it is from Pew. Some of it is actually from the World Economic Forum. So just to cite all of that stuff, and you can see the PowerPoints later and see all of those. So the, some of the data on the making of Gen Z, and we pulled out these six so you could get a sense of the high-level things that are forming Gen Z right now. The first one, I'll go through all of them, and then we'll talk a little bit about them. Technology, worldview, identity, diversity, security, and parents. So some of the data that you see up there so 57% of, of the kids surveyed, and by the way, this generation I think is like 70 million, it's 69 or 70 million, I believe it's the biggest generation, even bigger than the baby boomer generation, it's an enormous generation. So 57% of them use their screen, their screen four hours or more a day. Actually, when you break that down into teenagers, it's like five or six hours a day. And you may think, ah, that's not so much. I mean, I don't know how much, do you turn on your screen time? Do you know how much screen time you have? I don't think I have four or five hours a day, um, but I bet if I looked, I, I might get close to it. But when you start adding that up, I mean, they're in school for eight hours a day. They, they have to sleep. for So when you start adding it up, that's a pretty significant, it's probably a fifth of a day, pretty significant amount of time that's being influenced by those things, that's in, being influenced by technology. The second, 4% of that 70 million, and this stat, Karen made me check this stat multiple times because she couldn't, I think, because she couldn't believe the stat, 4% of them have a biblical worldview. And that doesn't mean necessarily that they're Christian or not, but that they understand the, the context. Um, Schaefer used to call it the moral motions or the Christian context of Western civilization. 
Um, and that used to be accepted and just kind of built into the wharf and woof. And so there were assumptions that you could make uh, about references, uh, assumptions you could make about the way people thought about reality and truth that no longer are being made. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. 33% say gender is determined by how one feels, so roughly a third um, are saying that, that gender is, is fluid, um, and you'll see some more stats on how they're forming some of their identities in good ways and in ways that may be potentially harmful. 39% uh, interact with people that are different from them, so the demographics of this generation are, have shifted and they interact with a much more diverse population than I certainly did or than the boomer generation did as well. 43% have um, defined happiness by financial success, which I find very interesting, and we'll see some of the data as well. There is this, for whatever reason, and you can, you can generations kind of influence other generations, there is this uh, insecurity apparently around this generation um, about not being happy and not having any money. And so that's a driver of a lot of their behaviors and a lot of their activity and a lot of their goal is I want money and I want time to be happy um, and to do the things that I wanna do. Um, security and then parents. So still a large number say parents play a significant role in their rearing and in their raising, but that number is way down. So they, the other 40, what is that, 44%, um, the parents don't play a significant role. And a subsequent question on this one was the parents are the primary role models, but that the influence is not primary. So they're with them and they're around them, but that the influence is not just the, the families. So, all right, well, let's look at a little bit of this. So, Gen Z on screen time, now this is self-reporting. This is them talking about their own screen time. A couple things to notice here, they're on the screens a lot. We said four hours a day, but you might notice something interesting here that a high percentage of them, about 60% of them, think they're spending too much time on their phones. And we'll talk about this as we go through. You're gonna essentially see four points here, that this generation is a bunch of screenagers. They're a post-Christian generation. Um, their identity is fairly, is fairly fluid and they're after financial success. So you're gonna see all four of those. One of the things that we'll talk about at the end of the, of the slide set is this generation is a little bit, is, is fairly self-aware. You're gonna see a lot of data that you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. So they're on these devices, they're using these devices, they're being influenced by these devices, but they're also aware that these devices may be overused um, and are willing to be self-critical of themselves. You see that, see that here. This is the slide I referenced earlier. So five hours um, for teens, for young adults, almost seven hours, men and women, five and six. So a significant amount of time staring at a phone, significant amount of time on the phone. And again, we're gonna talk more about good and bad with both of those, but that's about a fifth of a day, of any given day, where this generation is self-reporting that they are looking at a screen, particularly looking at a phone. This doesn't even take into account the time they might be on a computer or some other form of media. All right, so we're going to take this one uh, slow for a minute because there's a lot of data here. So you'll see, let's just take the top part. So I have access to lots of information. The question is, what, like, what are you doing with all of this? Does it make your life easier? So a vast majority of them say, I, I get, have access to information. We're going to talk a little bit more about AI and how it might be transforming in education. This ubiquity of information is certainly changing the way that we go about teaching, especially in the grammar phase, because information is everywhere and students can just get it. By getting, on, by getting on a phone or asking a chat bot. Let's me connect more with my family and friends. So a lot of the data around this is they, they are on these things to get information and to connect with other people. And an irony that you'll see, and I think Nathan and some of the panel will talk about this as well, is that there's an irony in all of this connectivity around the screens because it does connect, but it also produces some type of, of isolation um, as well, as you may well know. Helps me better and be better informed around the world, able to do my schoolwork better. So a lot of utilitarian and connective stuff. It makes my daily activities more convenient, sort of. It adds joy to my life, mm, less than half say it adds more joy to their life. I found a community of people like me, about a third say that, which is interesting because you're gonna see a third on the flip side of the Im negative impact um, of technology on their group and communities. More productive, about a third, and then it's a hub for nearly everything in my life. So you see productivity and community, and then a lot of things that we might associate with that, like it brings joy, I found a community that the majority of, these, of this generation is saying, no, it doesn't actually do that. Some interesting, uh, more, a little bit more interesting, more data. In what ways does technology actually make your life difficult? So they recognize they wasted a lot of time um, on technology. That's good. Put off doing other things, more distracted. So again, 
good recognition of more than half or half of this, of this generation that this can be something that is, is distracting them and something that is not beneficial to them. And then you see, I feel less productive, devices separate people, seems like my attention span is shorter, feel anxious when I'm not on the phone. Now here's some that are odd. So these are part of why I, th I think this generation is fairly aware of what's going on. Some of these are counterintuitive. So the question was, would you rather talk to your friends in person or would you rather text them? We're at 80% would rather talk to another human being of this generation than text. That's counterintuitive to me um, because I, I text. I don't want to talk to other people. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but we see them texting all the time, so you just assume they would, that's how they would want to engage. But 80% of them say, I'd rather sit down with a person. So thoughtful. Go outside when the weather is nice, 66. So two-thirds of them stay inside and be online. So two-thirds of them would rather be outside than staying inside and being online. Again, counterintuitive and somewhat self-reflective, I would say, if they're, that, if they're that aware. Spend time online versus spending time with family. 70% of them would rather spend time with their family than spend time online. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's going on in your house, but um, interesting, that one's counterintuitive to, to me as well. And then spend time online versus reading a book. Sorry, faculty, sorry, teachers. <laughs> they better surf than read the book. So we'll have to work harder on that one. That one doesn't seem counterintuitive. That seems like what we've observed as well. And then one more, spending time online or going outside, taking a walk or a run. So interesting, huh? Interesting data and an interesting kind of set for this generation that it seems like they're on their devices a lot. It's around productivity and around um, making connections with other people, but they seem to be fairly self-aware around some of the downsides of, of the ability of technology to build community. All right. This one is just a slide that I found fascinating, and you may as well. So this one, it's a lot of data here. I'll, I'll make it short. This one, they categorized three different groups, resilient disciples, which are essentially fo uh, students who are really plugged into church, and then um, habitual churchgoers, so folks that are, that are going to church, but they're not so much plugged into all the aspects of it, and then nomads, which were folks who may or may not be going to church. What's fascinating is the resiliency um, factor, the, the purple one, and I give a lot of thought to the content and entertainment I see. I give a lot of thought to the content and the news I take in. So the resilient disciples are in the 80th percentile on both of those, like being very self-critical and very aware of what's going on. But what's also fascinating is look how high that nomad number is. So certainly there's more self-criticism, and you'll see in a minute here, um, about how folks are thinking in that, or in that orange bar. But still, that tells me a, that, that these, this generation is thought, being thoughtful about how they engage this, at least when they're taking a survey. It may not matriculate out, but there's a lot to work with there. All right, let's talk a little bit about worldview. So this is, worldview is not lying and telling the truth. Please don't, I'm not simplifying it down to that, but some interesting data around that. Just to give you a comparison of what I was talking about, about those of us born a long, long time ago, um, that'd be me, not any of y'all, and, and this generation. So you can see, the question was, is lying morally wrong? So interesting. You can see the progression and kind of the deconstruction to the truth becoming much more individualized and lying not be an objective uh, truth or an objective falsehood and becoming more of something that's morally relative. So this generation has an interesting relationship to the idea of morality and truth. What is morally right and wrong changes over time based on society. So truth is just made up by society, individuals deciding and coming together that that's true and that's false. And so you can also see the, the degrading of that over time. And again, not making a judgment, just pointing out something um, about, about this generation. So you see that it's, that's 12% with the boomers all the way down to 24%. So roughly a quarter um, of gener Gen Z thinks that truth is a social construct, that it's just made up by individuals and it's not objective reality. That definitely is going to have an impact on how you see the world. It's definitely going to impact on how you engage other people, how you engage everything that you do. A couple of other things around identity, not so much around gender, but about how technology is shaping the identity of students. Um, the question was, looking at other people's posts makes me feel bad about the lack of excitement in my life. I'm in the 8%. No, I, I don't have <laughs> social media. So um, anyway, I gave, my, I gave my students flip phones when they were in, in school, and I was not very popular. But you can see the difference there. So all the way down around 8%, um, the boomers up to almost 40% um, with Gen Z, that the, the 
the expectation is being formed that life ought to be what this image is. I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, we, I'm going to Florida tomorrow. Um, and we go to my brother's c condominium, and it's right on the beach. And so every day we're just sitting on the beach, you know, under an umbrella, just looking at the ocean. Um, and last time I went, there was a family next to us, and there were a couple of young ladies there, and the mom and the dad. And every, I don't know, every hour or so, the young lady would get up, pick up her paddleboard, go out into the ocean. She didn't paddleboard. Um, she used the paddleboard as a prop, and her mom came out with the phone and took pictures. And I was so confused. I'm just like, <laughs> Paige is, you know, I'm in a chair. Paige and I are sitting in an umbrella. I'm like, what? <laughs> what, is she, what are they doing? And she told me what they were doing. They were taking pictures. It wasn't like snap, okay, let's go back. It was, it was 30 minutes of of. To retake, 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 different pose, retake, retake, retake. She never got on the paddleboard. They never went paddleboarding. Um, and then an hour later, I guess the light changed, and here we go. And they, they went back out all day. So by the end of the day, I was super confused, <laughs> but all day. And, so, you know, obviously that's what we're talking about right here is that, that that image is carefully crafted, posted, and then, you know, Patrick's like, I'm supposed to be out there doing that great thing too, when in reality that person wasn't even doing the thing that they were posting but impact on identity. Looking at other people's posts often makes me feel bad about the way I look, same type of thing. I mean, almost non-existent in the boomer generation, Gen X, all the way up to 30%. So definitely shaping the identity of individuals through technology and through social media. I'm gonna hit that mark, Karen. <laughs> um, here's diversity slide as well. I'm sorry you can't actually see the percentages here, but the point is, that the uh, culture is a much more diverse place and that our Gen Z students and Gen children are interacting with that. Um, again, not saying good or bad or indifferent, it's just they are exposed to a lot more diversity of population than someone might have been you know, 40 years ago. Um, and that has an impact on the shaping of their understanding of people and a community and all of those types of things as well. All right, so spend a little time talking about, uh, talking about each of those and the making of Gen Z. So we'll uh, walk away with a couple of things. So they're on their screens a lot. They're doing technology a lot. But as I've said before, they seem to be doing it for information and to connect with others and recognizing the limitations of it, performing community and even being somewhat self-critical about the amount of time um, that they spend on it. Second bullet there, don't underestimate that, that gen this generation. Um, they seem to be smart, self-reflected and serious and willing to work hard. And so we can leverage that as we talk to them about their tech. That can be a compliment as opposed to shut it because your brain's gonna rot. Um, maybe we could engage with, okay, I understand what you're doing there and you're being you know, self-critical about that. Let's have a conversation about the phone or let's have a conversation about the screen time knowing that they're gonna take you seriously and they're gonna engage. And then helping them build resilience in the face of anxiety. There was a lot of data around 9-11 um, and around COVID and the impact that that has had on just making anxious kids. Um, making anxious students, so recognizing that, that there is maybe a healthy amount of anxiety or less than healthy amount of anxiety um, in them, but that's an opportunity for us to step into that place with, well, for the, for the Christian and the Christian school, with the gospel and with the truth of that, um, and for just engaging those students and recognizing where they are um, to help them. All right, we're going to shift real quick. We're going to move from Gen, Gen Z to AI. Um, I thought, it would be, I thought it would be helpful. So the questions that we led with were, is, is tech raising your kids or is social media raising your kids? The answer is yes. Um, that was a joke. The answer is sort of, but you have, a pro, you, you have a great opportunity to step into that space, understanding where the students are and how they're consuming that technology. The second question was, is AI going to raise your kids in the future? The answer is yes, no. The answer is, well, maybe. There's some, there's some elements of AI that are certainly harmful, and there's some elements of AI that are going to be helpful. So I wanted to just kind of go through this high level, give a sense of what's going on in the world and what are people thinking about AI, and then show you a couple of just fun things about how we're thinking about using AI in education, and then we'll call the panel up. So attitudes around the world, seems like from some of the Pew data, parts, parts of it are exciting and parts of it are terrifying. Um, about what AI can do. And I, I didn't see any data on Terminator, but I see, you know, facial recognition and people being, you know, being able to do like predictive types of things. You know, those have blessings and cursings. And so there's a lot of, wow, that could really help out, or wow, that's terrifying because 
you know, now they come arrest Mr. Carruth because he fits a profile and might, you know, hadn't even committed a crime, but now he goes to jail early. That was Minority Report. Was that the movie? Yeah. Um, application specific and dependent, so it does seem like attitudes around it vary from what the thing is that AI is being used for. Education and innovation are most likely to change and improve, so you'll see some of the information on what's AI going to disrupt next, and it's schools, it's education, the way we go about doing school. And then the trust is inversely related to the development of the country. And I have no idea what the significance of that is, but I thought it was a fascinating uh, piece of data. The more developed the country, the lower the trust in AI and vice versa, which I'm not sure what to do with that, but thought you might want to see it. So here we go, more excited than concerned, more concerned than excited, equally concerned and excited. The vast majority of folks are like, hey, this is going to be great, or I'm excited, but I got some questions. Um, so I guess that's good for us going forward. This shows you what I've said about the different types of things. So they asked about facial recognition technology um, that be used by police. Good idea for society, most people thought yes. Bad idea for society, most people thought no. Driverless passenger vehicles, it's flipped. So if we're using AI to have cars drive around, then, they, then it's flipped. So it's very much uh, based on what exactly is it that we're looking at um, for AI. Then I mentioned this, so what's the most significant change that's coming through AI? The way we learn. Um, the ability, and I'm going to give you an example in a minute, but the ability to individualize instruction and assessment I think is the most powerful thing that's going to happen through AI, to be able to know where, you're, where your student is, even if they're in a classroom type of setting, and to be able to meet them where they are even more precisely than just having a small class and knowing them. So I think that's coming. Um, and then you see the same thing, expected to improve. So change, education, expected to be better, education as well. And you can see how the rest of those break out in different industries. And let's have a little, little fun here. There's that graph that I showed you before. So the, the ones below the line are mostly developed countries and the trust index goes that way. And the ones above the, excuse me, the trust index goes that way. The ones above the line are actually the undeveloped country, underdeveloped countries. And so the trust index is higher. All right, so here's what I think we might be seeing in education. Increased faculty productivity, increased staff productivity, student individualization and, and timely -er feedback, increased interpersonal interaction, and then increased time to do mentoring and discipleship. Let's take a look, and I'm sorry these are gonna be tiny because I'm not very good at PowerPoint. So here's what I asked chat, Bing chat, and if you can, maybe you can see it up there, I'm hoping. So I asked it, Create a one-hour lesson plan for introducing genetics to high school students. We sped this up a little bit, but not much. I think it's like double speed. So it's going to make a lesson plan for me. I don't know anything about genetics. I mean, I know the Punnett square, but that's all I know. It's going to make a lesson plan for me. Now, clearly, I'd have to be, I have to know what to go do, right? I have to go to class, I mean, go to school and have my BS or my MS or my doctorate to know how to teach this, but it, it's creating a lesson plan for me. Kevin, how long does it take you to make a lesson plan? Okay. So Kevin said 45 minutes. This is going to do it in about a minute and a half. The second thing I asked it to do was take that lesson plan and differentiate the learning. So I've got different kids in my classroom. Differentiate the learning. And you'll see it creates the exact same lesson plan. And then in each of those activities, there's one, a modification for visual learners, auditory learners, reading and writing learners, and kinesthetic learners. Activity two, same thing. It's going to take a minute for it to do that. Now, granted, the teacher still has to know what they're doing. You've got to know what a kinesthetic learner is and how to relate to the kinesthetic learner. You are going to have to edit the lesson plan. It's not going to be something you just pull off and go do. But that's the type of increased productivity that's possible to get all of that started and imagine, hey, I'm a faculty member, I'll start here, I'll refine from there, I know the content, I know learning styles, now I can go execute that and I just saved four hours of time that I can now go mentor three kids. Or I can help Billy or Sally. So increase fa faculty productivity, that's the first one. And let, what did I ask it on this one? Let's see what I asked it on this one. Oh, so let's say you're starting a business and you don't know what a P&L is. So you're like, hey, I want to know what a P&L is. We're a private school. I need to know what a P&L is. I need to know what a P&L is. That should scare you that I, I know what a P&L is. Um, <laughs> but let's say you're starting out. You don't have any clue. So let's just ask it. What's a P&L? Profit and loss statement. So it's going to say, hmm, 
all right, I'll give you a sample of a profit and loss statement. So it explains what a profit and loss statement is and gives a, an example. So imagine you're, uh, I don't know, you're a b brand new business owner, you have no idea what that is. You're a brand new head of school, you have no idea what that is. Well, now you're gonna be able to get up to speed much more quickly than having to necessarily go back to school, take a three hour credit, and you know, frankly, to learn a profit and loss, you probably don't need a three hour credit. This is not, this is not brain surgery, okay? So increased productivity of staff. And the last thing was increased individualized instruction. What am I gonna ask it to do now? I am asking it to quiz me on my multiplication tables. <laughs> now mind you, I just did this. I know special stuff. I just did this and then we made a video of it. So it's gonna quiz me on my multiplication tables. I kept answering it. It said, correct, you're great. And then I gave it some other answers and it said, nope, that's not correct. Here's the correct answer. And I know that this is not even the good stuff. I know there are programs out there that will actually continue, give you hints, explain to you what you did wrong in your computation. So imagine if you're a student, you know, you're in math class, you're learning your multiplication, and you're a whiz kid, but, and you got soccer. And you go home, and you take your, you do your math, and after three problems, the AI's like, you got it, you're good, go, go play soccer. Mom can say, go play soccer, dad, but the AI says, you're good, like I've tested you. And then Patrick, who needs to do his multiplication tables over and over, and he doesn't get to go to soccer until he finishes, it continues, and it iterates, and it iterates, and it iterates, and so an hour and a half later, Patrick still isn't doing his multiplication tables very well, and it says, hey, stop. It's been an hour and a half. There's no way you're gonna continue to get this right. I'm gonna produce some analytics from Ms. Graham, and tomorrow when you go into school, she'll be able to spend personal time with you, because clearly, Patrick, you missed something. And and that doesn't, that doesn't require the faculty member to do much more time-wise than, than we would be doing in the older model. But now we can individualize the instruction so that Patrick gets a little extra help. Um, and Sally, who went off to soccer, is going to be able to be challenged now. Now we're going to give Sally page three. Patrick's going to stay on page one today. So a lot of opportunity there for um, differentiating instruction. Whoops. So I'll wrap up here. So began, we began with tech and wise, and so I want to close with, um, obviously we're a Christian school, um, and we believe in producing graduates of wisdom, compassion, and courage, and fundamentally the notion of wisdom is bound up in what the scriptures tell us, and so one has to understand that Christian context um, in order to be wise, be compassionate, and courageous in engaging the thing, whatever the thing is. We're happy to, we're happy to talk about tech tonight, um, and you saw the data um, on Gen Z. So I think that's one of the big challenges for us and one of the big opportunities for us as a Christian school, but just as folks in, in culture who, um, who uh, um, are people of faith, is to be able to help this generation understand that biblical worldview and thereby understand wisdom and compassion and courage as it's taught, understand what truth, beauty, and goodness is, and then be able to say, okay, how do I then engage in this circumstance with this particular tool? Because it's not the tool. It's how we engage that tool. So we're going we're gonna to wrap up with that and spend some time here in a minute transitioning to the panel coming up. I'm going to ask them to come on up, and then I'll introduce them in a minute, and we're going to do a little Q&A. And Dave and I are going to move this and hopefully not drop it. I got the water. As you saw, Dave did a most of that. <laughs> All right. Well, this is our panel. Everyone here works at the Bear Creek School. So we have Dave, Ur Dave Urban, um, our assistant uh, dean of students. Is it associate or assistant? Upper school associate, not assistant. Whatever Upper school want. associate dean of students. Um, Miss Linda Graham, who is our math department chair and uh, faculty innovation coach. So she's going to have a lot to tell you about what we do here at Bear Creek. Um, got Kevin Davidson, our upper school dean of students. Nathan Pettit, our middle school dean of students, and then Michelle Lee, our upper school counselor. So I'm gonna quiz them with some questions. Who wants to go first? Nathan wants to go first. <laughs> All right, Nathan. So you, you said in, in, in preparing for this um, that there was a book or an author or somebody you had read who had a phrase that you really liked, which was don't click like about social media and its interaction. Tell us a little bit about what don't click like, what does that mean? Yeah, um, so it was set within the context of something that you hit on, which was uh, our kids, ourselves, 
if we're on social media and on our phones a lot, are highly connected to other people, but the depth of those connections um, is not always transparent in those interactions. And so this author, um, he's a professor named Cal Newport, um, had a heading in one of his books and it said, don't click like, and it caught my attention. And so basically his theory that he played out with um, real life examples was that any, any time we click like, somebody posts something and we like it or we, we interact with it at some level, um, it's fueling this notion in us that we just had a connection that didn't really happen. So maybe an example would be, um, I'm close with my younger sister. She lives in Denver, Colorado. She has three boys. And um, I get the sense that I'm involved in her life and getting updates on what's going on just by kind of seeing what she posts online. And I like those posts, and so it feels like we had an interaction. And the theory is that if I were to stop doing that, and I did this to practice it, um, if I were to stop interacting in those ways, I would find myself more eager to connect in deeper ways. And so by by reducing the amount of shallow connections, we tend to prioritize deeper connections, like phone calls or FaceTime or in-person visits. Um, so Cal Newport had story after story of people who, who did that and experienced it, and I tested it on myself and found that there was some traction there as well. Good, well, and I also know you have children, so are you doing any of that uh, with your children or applying that type of principle to your children? Any, any ideas or tips for folks? Yeah, I think obviously my children are a bit younger than um, some others who have kids on this panel. Are they and in so Gen Alpha? Do we have them? In I the believe so. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. are. Okay. I mean, I've got seven and younger, <laughs> seven to seven months. And I mean, it is an area where I will say um, we are grateful for FaceTime. I mean, we, we don't have, we did have some family who was local here and they've all since moved away. So being able to see grandma and grandpa or Grammy and grandpa, and Nana and opa, um, through the phone is much better than the alternative of not seeing them at all or not really getting to see their faces or hear their voices. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of the, that's about the media level of connection that they're at right now. So you're just controlling, all, controlling that right mm -hmm. now while they're, while they're younger. Mm -hmm. Dave, you mentioned something as we were prepping for this as well around how social media can create like a narcissism or a narcissistic, I don't know, attitude towards yourself. Uh, so that's probably redundant. So talk a little bit about that. Sure, um, and I'll put myself as an example, so I'm not casting stones by saying that. And I also hate to start off with a negative uh, <laughs> comment on this um, because we are not a anti-tech family by any means in our home. But um, I've just found for myself, I've found as I interact with students, my own kids, that there is, there is just this reality around technology, particularly social media, where the more, and there's an irony to it, of course, right, with social media because the whole point is being social, being about other people, and yet there is, um, I, you know, Linda or some others could maybe help me out with the actual science behind it, but there's definitely a reality I see of it's so easy online to just make things more about yourself than you otherwise would, right? And, you know, for, for our family, um, the conversation around tech isn't, we just want to keep the kids safe. Obviously, that's important, right? You know, let them make sure they don't see certain types of content. They stay physically safe. That's a huge issue, right, in this world with technology of, of bridging tech to our physical lives and, and how people can enter into that in negative ways. Um, but the bigger goal, right, is we're trying to raise kids, whether it has to do with technology, athletics, school, whatever, um, that are virtuous, kids that will um, go out into the world and make a difference and not make life about themselves. And so I think our one of our big focuses in training up our kids when it comes to technology is just making sure that they recognize there is this dangerous rabbit trail that is potentially there that um, that kind of enable them to make it all about themselves, right? And we also know from data that people who live lives of service, of community, of looking outward, tend to be much happier, tend to be much more at peace with themselves. I think that is, um, feels unconventional to the human mind and particularly the teenage mind, but but it is true. And so how do we how do we help them recognize that, right? That you can really go down a narcissistic road um, if you're not careful when it comes to technology, particularly social media. Yeah, I like the so. way you, fra you, you phrase that. So it was help them to recognize the negative, but don't just live in the negative. Give them experiences where they're doing the opposite, where they're getting out of themselves yeah. and engaging in other activities. Yeah. So I'm assuming you mean like, go serve at church or go on a mission trip or just help people sure. and consciously as a family putting 
the, your children in those spaces and making that part of their reality. And, and so ironic from some of the data you showed too, right? That kids are actually recognizing, I want to be physically present. I want to uh, hear from my parents, all these sorts of things. And the great irony is they can get, they can lose what they actually truly desire if they don't have good training, good virtue around how they use technology. Yeah, I love that. So not just taking the thing away, but let's, let's engage in the alternate virtue that yep. we're after, yep, put absolutely. that in front of our students. All right, he mentioned the science thing <laughs> and the whole, the whole addictiveness, and, and so tell us a little bit about like dopamine and how it works in our body and, and how that, that feeds, and then maybe what do we do with all that? What are some tips? Yeah, well, I'm no expert in neuro, neuroscience, <laughs> So, but I study counseling and, you know, I study psychology. And so what I can say about dopamine is that a lot, you know, a lot of us know that dopamine is a feel good hormone that the brain releases. For example, when there is a stimuli such as looking at laughing faces, um, when you get a message from your loved ones, or when you get positive recognition from your peers, your brain produces dopamine. Right. So similarly in tech or social media or just any platform, for example, we talked about getting likes on, you know, social media or hitting likes. Right. You kind of get likes. You feel good about it. <laughs> um, or let's say I don't know how many of you here are Amazon shopper. Right. Sometimes we shop online and we've been looking at something. And when you get a notification saying that this item is on sale. It's true. That feels good. It's, it's prime days, right? It's prime <laughs> Today days right and now. tomorrow <laughs> are prime days. <laughs> but those <laughs> notifications, right, when you see these, unexpectedly especially, the brain releases dopamine. And so I think what it does is that this repeated action can make our brain kind of crave those. And so I would say maybe like the pitfall is that we can find yourself kind of like looking at your phone like every five seconds, right? Because especially those notifications that you get, you're not expecting, you're not necessarily expecting getting however many likes or all these, you know, whatever prime day notification that you get, but it's those random reward that you get that makes your brain kind of get hooked on it. And so I think you kind of check, you tend to, I mean, not just the teenagers, not just the children, but us adults, I myself included, I find myself kind of like looking at it even when I'm feeling a little bored, just out of habit. And so I'll say that's kind of like a little bit of pitfall. Um, but I know a lot of you might think, oh, like then is that addiction, right? Are we all addicted to it? I do want to be a little cautious about using the term addiction, just because if you're really thinking about addiction, it's a brain disorder, right? It's a brain disorder that actually has some effect into um, your brain, chemical changes, and um, change, like functional changes in your brain circuit. So I would say um, to just be cautious when we're using the term addiction, especially on our children, and not to use it so lightly. Um, I know that sounds kind of negative, <laughs> but on the flip side, the good thing, the positive or the benefits of social media or just any platform is that connectedness, right? Co connectivity with peers. A lot of students do feel connected just because they feel like they can get access to friends easily. And it's not just social media, but also FaceTime, like Nathan has said as well. Mm -hmm. um, or they get exposed to different, you know, cultures or different um, group of people that they normally don't have interaction with. And so then they learn empathy as well. So they're a lot of resources that are out there for the students to kind of learn from and not just for students but also for parents as well you know if you have children that are kind of struggling oftentimes we do find a lot of good resources on the platform like social media platform um, and obviously we have to do some more research but yeah I think um, the key point though is that social media is not necessarily bad tech use is not necessarily bad but I think it's to really find a good balance on how we use social media or just any technology platform. Yeah, super helpful. The reminder about addiction is great. And also um, the reminder to be aware of like how many times we pick that thing up and to help our students and our children to be aware of how many times we pick that thing up and to be conscious about, oh, I've picked it up a hundred, a hundred times today. Is that really what I want? Be aware and intentional about that. So Kevin, you work with upper school students. Tell me a little bit about like, 
what, what do you what do you see in in engaging upper school students around tech? I mean, and you had an interesting phrase about you know this philosophical caution that we not see all tech as evil and bad. So tell us a little bit about what you see and what you meant by that. Yeah, I think that um, especially as adults, um, you know, I can remember the time not having a cell phone, and then there's a time when the cell phone comes into my possession and stuff, and there's there's a temptation to see like, oh, I, I, I know how to live without this, you know, using the road maps back in my day type thing. And you, you had know, road maps? Yeah, yeah, nice. you know, using the Atlas maps. Yeah, I had to like, use the sextant. Yeah, yeah, that type of thing, you know, and, and like, oh, this could this generation possibly use any, you know, those road maps and stuff, or so dependent on Google maps and stuff. Or, or we hear about changes in brain chemistry and whatnot associated with the increased technology usages and things, and we get really concerned about that. And I'm not even saying that it's not right that we get concerned about some of those things because obviously these are changes happening. But the piece that I always want to kind of lead out with is um, not to be flippant about this, but that uh, change is a part of the human condition uh, and that society has consistently changed over time and has had new permutations of what it means to exist in a society that has constantly come back to the center point of what does it mean to exist as a human being in a society at any given point and reevaluate what that means. Uh, what it means for me to be this person interacting, like whether that's from the change from the oral to the written traditions, or, I mean, that, that was a huge change. And most of us here in this building would love the written tradition at this point. But I mean, we can't deny that there are people that at the time lamented the loss of the oral tradition and what that meant, or, or any number of changes. I mean, we can track it back a long time. So we have to be really careful when we're talking about change that we not just immediately come at it and say, change is bad, change is change. And if I'm feeling bad about change, then I need to be, that's me. And maybe I'm, I've got my discomfort. Because sometimes that change is okay. Um, the reality is everything that we're experiencing in, in high school right now, uh, sitting behind a desk um, and learning from a teacher at the front of the room, that was not always how education was. Uh, that was a, that, that's a post-industrial education that at one time did not exist. And that at one time was created to fulfill the needs of the society that this is how we do something. To fulfill a marketplace need to get workers into the workplace. And that changed from another thing. And instead, you know, all of this stuff, um, maybe some of the challenges are good. You know, again, not to be too flippant, but we see that students now, as you mentioned earlier, they have access to information that is incredibly robust and powerful. Uh, they can, they're learning to do more and go faster and further than we've ever imagined. There are students that are now tackling problems that um, we created <laughs> to some extent. Uh, the great garbage patch in the Pacific Ocean, mm -hmm. there are students, there are teenagers that are leveraging their understanding of technology to find those solutions. That's powerful. Um, and that they are living in an age where those solutions can actually be actualized and capitalized is something that we have just not ever seen before. Or um, one of my favorite stories is a few years ago, there was a, um, a protein chain as part of a viral strand that for 10 years, experts in biology could not unpack, unwrap the protein chain. And these are experts. So what did they do? They, they created a video game out of it and put it online for free, said gamers go at it. Within a few weeks, gamers <laughs> solved the protein strand and unwrapped it. A 10 year problem unwrapped by gamers for free online because their brain are changing to conceptualize problems in brand new ways. They are able to use this technology to understandably stand on the shoulders of people that have come before them and say, great, now let me reach further and go beyond. And that's, that's okay. So we have to be cautious, um, of not of, 
of just the tech, but maybe our own presuppositions. Yeah, so the takeaway there may, is for us to be recognize change is, is inevitable and to, to recognize that our students in this generation are probably receptive to that and feel it as well and to engage them in that space of change and teach them not to be afraid of that, of that space. Lean in so that we can be part of speaking about the virtue formation in that space. Because if we don't lean in early to be a part of the virtue conversations, then we forfeit that to someone else to be a part of the virtue conversations. And they may not be our virtues that are being a part of that conversation. Yeah, and as you saw from the data, there's a, there is a place to shape that uh, because uh, about a third of the students are in this generation believe that that's all relative. So there's a, there's a big opportunity there. Nathan, you want to say something? Yeah. Then I have a question for Linda. Okay, I just was going to comment on something Kevin said because I think for the reasons that he's he's presenting, we need better mechanisms for evaluating technology than just is it good or is it bad um, because that's pretty flat and and not doesn't get into the nuances of what we're doing. And so one that I've appreciated um, from Andy Crouch is basically kind of proposing two promises and pitfalls anytime we engage with technology related to capacity and burden. So often a new technology will come with a promise of now you will be able to. So with the invention of the ve motor vehicle, now you'll be able to you know, go 10 miles in 10 minutes as opposed to 10 hours or whatever. Um, and now you'll no longer have to. So uh, a burden reduction and a, an increased capacity, weighing that and leveraging that against some potential and sometimes unseen reduction of capacity and, and um, in, in, uh, addition of burden. And so now you will no longer be able to, and now you will have to. Another, just a couple examples. So um, Kevin mentioned uh, navigating. I have a pretty terrible sense of natural direction, whereas you can spin my wife around 10 times in the dark and she can tell you which way is north, south, east, and west. So as a young driver, I did have maps out or map quest, and I would print that before I'd go somewhere new and inevitably miss a turn and then try to figure out, okay, where am I on the map and try to retrace my steps, and it was messy. Um, and then, of course, now with Google Maps on my phone, that's not a problem anymore. But I don't think it's just as simple as saying it's bad or good. I think you're weighing things in there. Like, because I use Google Maps, I'm not developing a greater sense of natural direction. And if that's a priority for me, then maybe I need to think about using Google Maps less. But another value for me is safety. And so the fact that a voice can tell me when it's time to turn left and I'm not trying to, like, do three things at, l at once is a value for me with four kids in the car. Um, so I think for all those reasons, in, that's just been helpful for me um, to think about uh, capacity and burden and not just is it good or is it bad because it's so much more nuanced than just that. Yeah, that's good. So walking through cost benefit with your, with your students and with your children. I like what you said, the prom what's the promise and what's the pitfall mm -hmm. or the, what's the capacity and what's the burden mm -hmm. and then you have a discussion around those because we do, live in a, we do live in a fallen world but it was created good and so it's not bad, it's a fallen good world. So that's always our dilemma, isn't it, is what is the promise and what is the pitfall. That's a helpful little schema to do that. Thanks, Nathan. Linda, you're in this space all the time trying to teach us and others how to use technology and to use it well in the education space. So um, I know you deal with digital citizenship a lot. Maybe start there. Tell us a little bit about what we do here at Bear Creek with, with digital citizenship. And then how do, we, how do we think about innovation here at Bear Creek, Linda? Sure. I think I'm realizing especially when I think about the, the differences between the generations. I represent the oldest group here. <laughs> um, seasoned, but seasoned. Seasoned, okay, seasoned, I like that. <laughs> um, we, we have to be sort of clever, especially with our upper school kids, about how we approach it. But, but I think about that too, like even in my own life, nobody likes to be lectured. My husband does not <laughs> like to be lectured, right? Like, so we need to have a conversation about these things, like the th the thing, the, the issue that we have, that's a problem we can tackle together. And so how, how can we do that? So at Bear Creek, um, we do issue um, a laptop device. We started with Surfaces to the upper school. We asked them to, to do a digital citizenship training. But we have woven the themes of digital citizenship throughout the, the curriculum. We have some assemblies where we're having to get even more clever about how we weave that in. We have a thing we, we're calling BC Forum where we can talk about larger conversations that are 
you know, how do we deal with relationships that are in person and messy sometimes, because we're messy people, but also how do we deal with that when it's online? Uh, privacy and security. Um, we, that's an important thing for, for students to know. Like, I, we, we all are susceptible to scams and phishing and all, all the things, so we talk about that. We actually have digital citizenship curriculum that's woven into lower school at a level they can understand as they take their first um, classes uh, with Mr. Grant and, um, and then with Mr. Ricard. We have some digital citizenship, I think, in the middle school that I, I believe Stephanie Myers has helped spearhead. Um, so we are definitely proactive about that. The cool thing is you can be part of that conversation too because the materials we use largely are from Common Sense Media, so you're going to get some tips about that later. Um, some, we also have a, a I think it's Axis, mm -hmm. is, is on our website, and I believe you have some access to that too, mm -hmm. and they're f fabulous conversation starters. So I, you know, if, you're, if there are issues at home, think about using Bing Copilot to ask, <laughs> what are 10 ways that, that savvy parents deal with their, you know, phones at their, that their kids are using, or um, how can I make a, a digital contract with my kids for screen time, or, you know, there, you'd be surprised, like, you could get some pretty good ideas in a few, few moments, instead of the old Google search where I have to curate and decide <laughs> what's best and not. I, and what I like about Bing is you, you actually get the, you actually get the, the citations, yeah. and I really like that, so. Um, we are using digital storytelling to teach kids how to, how to build content. They, they're going to be content creators, and we want to help them do that responsibly, so we want them to know um, how to cite. And we have Research Coach, which is a really great tool. Um, we are trying to get the possibility for engaging in more global situations. We have a program that we started school-wide called Beyond Bear Creek, where we're trying to leverage the tools of technology that we have and that we developed during COVID, like silver lining that we know how to hold Teams calls. And so I can bring in engineers from, when my, my son-in-law lived in New York, he's a chemical engineer, time difference, space difference, but he could talk to my engineering class. or. Uh, an adopted uh, school between the second graders, I, I think it is, um, there's a school in Jakarta, and they're gonna do flip grid um, conversations and get to know, kind of like you would do pen pals, but a video call that's um, independent of time. So school-wide, we can make use of that kind of technology. Um, there's all kinds of things that we can do if, if we would leverage them with gamifying things to make it more fun. I used to pay my kids to do flashcards. <laughs> I was horrible. Uh, they were, <laughs> it was a time when flashcards for um, multiplication tables, like that wasn't a thing. Like you were gonna use calculators, you weren't gonna have to know it, but I didn't think that was true. I thought you needed to know your multiplication tables. And so I would pay them $5 every time they went through it. No, I think I paid them a dollar when they went through <laughs> it. And, but if they Inflation. got it perfect, they got five. So they know their multiplication tables. Um, but Gamifying things makes the process fun, and there are some great things out there for that. So as far as what we're doing at school in other ways, um, we are a Microsoft school, and Teams is a lifeline for us. We use it for a uh, platform for communication. We can collaborate. That's a very real-world skill. Um, I was thinking today, I forget who said it, but looking up things, the, it's at your fingertips. A, a student in my class in engineering did a presentation. It reminded me of um, a, a thing related to drought. I said, did you know we should be taking shorter showers? Like we're, we're called because there's a, the Seattle city has said that we have a slight drought condition. No, that can't be true. It's raining all the time here. I'm like, well, actually, <laughs> and I, I put a little link in the chat. They can go look at it later to see that, yeah, that's <laughs> really true. Um, we use digital tools like Flip, uh, as I said, we use Sway, we can use narrated PowerPoints, we can flip the classroom if we need to, teach the lesson that they would look at online, do the homework with me, 
Math is hard sometimes. Maybe we should do the homework at school. <laughs> you don't have to be an, you know, an expert in pre-calculus. If I do the, the lesson and they just watch the lesson at home, we do the homework in class. That might be a, a good model. Um, or if somebody's absent, we can, we can have a lesson for them. We use all kind of analytics. Uh, I love Microsoft Teams. Let me see who is doing their work and when. I can see that a kid is really working late at night. And I can maybe ha come up alongside him and say, man, I noticed you're doing the homework for my class. Like, you're starting at about 10. H how, wh it, you know, are you busy with other things? We can have a conversation about that. Um, so I think that's really great. We have insights in teams. We have reading coach for the lower um, school kids. Are there, they can read and we can do a diagnosis of um, their fluency and, and how, what reading level they might be at. That's amazing. Presenter coach, they can practice a speech in PowerPoint and get real-time cues. Uh, I used it before curriculum <laughs> night to practice my presentation. It's really great. Um, I should have. Well, you, you see, when you say um, you see if you're going too fast, you see if you're reading your slides. There's a whole bunch of analytics that come out of that. It's, it's awesome. I always worry, will I have enough time to say what I want to say? Uh, presenter coach is, is awesome. Research coach is fairly new, and a teacher can put in assignment research coach and curate. It, it helps them curate the research. And I have noticed our kids are not, they might be on screens, but they are not good digital natives. They don't know, they don't understand all these file structure. They don't know how to find good sources. And Research Coach really trains them for that, how to, how to know which websites might be the most credible, which probably are not, and that we have got to teach that. Um, we can use robotics for teaching coding in collaboration. Um, my new favorite thing that's coming along is using AR. You're probably seeing things like that, augmented reality. But we have a group, this Beyond Bear Creek idea. I can take a virtual tour of the Louvre. I can take a virtual tour of Athens. I mean, I'd like to go, I've, well, I've been to both those places, but I mean, but we can't take every class there, but we can see the things. It's pretty neat. Or how about if I could see a heart in biology class and 3D and move it around and cross sections of it. That's amazing. We can do that. That's so cool. So, so yeah, lots of, so lots of tools being used to do the, the work of education and to augment that and make it better. And then the first thing I th that you said that I thought was, was really important is using those tools to put the kids in virtuous situations and situations where we're affirming kind of what you started with, Dave putting them in situations using the technology so they can be virtuous as opposed to just, as you said, talking at them all the time. Um, maybe we do a little speed round right before, we, right before we wrap up. I'm curious, we'll get personal. So I'll go around to each of you. You have, you have, you have time, um, each of you, and either a personal tip for governing your tech, um, positive or negative, just a personal tip or a family tip if you're doing that with your students. So everybody think of one Real quick, and we'll go around. Dave, you're first. Uh, sure. So something that Linda said that prompted a thought in me, um, it, just back to the bigger picture of parenting, it certainly applies to technology, but my wife and I are big on mantras. We just have lots of what we also refer to as sticky statements that we just remind each other of all the time. And one that we learned early on in our parenting was rules without relationship often lead to rebellion. Um, so three R's, pretty easy to remember. And I love what Linda said about conversation. We try to, especially as they get older, right? Obviously when they're little, you know, it's, there's a lot of just straightforward rules. But as they get older, the goal is the relationship. And then we know as we invest in the relationship, the rules will make more sense. The rules will be easier to follow. The rules will um, be trusted more because there's a relationship to build the trust off of those sorts of things. Um, the other thing, I, and I'll, I'll sound like the old guy in the room by saying this, this is just us, but, um, but I will, if parents want to hear this from me, I, I will share it. Um, when they're still 16, 17, 18, my wife and I are still the parents. And so <laughs> um, I pay for that phone. <laughs> um, 
I know every password that they have. I can read their text whenever I want. I can shut down a, devi a device any moment I want, a uh, social media app whenever I want, and we do. <laughs> um, and I think that's okay to remember as parents, right, that you can, you can train up your kids in technology in a virtuous way while still remembering that God's given you a level of authority while they're still in your home to when you, when, when you need to, to step in and, and still be mom and dad, still be the parent. And, um, and so for us, we try to just remember that, that um, we don't have to fully release our kids yet into just the wild, wild west with technology, right? There's a lot of great tools, a lot of things that are built into phones these days, other things that um, we can still play a really active role to, to help them navigate this. Because for my oldest, the day is coming, you know this, Patrick, where I'm not, all those rules are gonna be gone. Right? I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna have their passwords anymore and things like that. So I wanna take every opportunity I can now to be pretty darn active and proactive in training them up and how to use that. And, and again, it's, it's, I think God's given us that authority to still play that role in their lives when they're still in our home at young ages. Good. That's great, thank you, Dave. Linda? Well, you stole mine. <laughs> we, we did the same thing with a car. Like, this is our car, we're letting you use it. And so that was helpful at times when we needed the leverage, and we did the same thing with the phones. I, my children both graduated from here quite a while ago, um, and it comes back around. I'm, j I'm just going to say that, the, the tech use. I, we go way back. We did not have Nintendo at our house um, or any video games. No like Mario Brothers? No. Nope. We just, but you know who did? Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> and why did Grandma have it? Because grandma wanted to quit smoking, and so did great grandma, and they <laughs> were fiends for Nintendo. So my kids would go to grandma's house once a week, once in the summer for a week, and they would just Nintendo their guts out, and then they would it would just be great, you know. Like I didn't have the problem, so I, I, it's not that I'm against them in principle, and I've come to see my my daughter, who's a physician, said to me when she was uh, learning to do some pipetting. Um, in college, uh, a kid said, to, or the TA said to her, didn't you ever play video games? Like, you should be better at this. <laughs> like, so maybe there's some hand-eye coordination? I don't know. But um, I guess when you see the parenting that you did and you tried to preserve the relationship, that is really an important thing. That your kids can then come back to you and say, Here's a book I think you'd like. You know my Audible account. Like, <laughs> I have my kids' Audible passwords. I really think you should read this book. How many times was I saying that as a parent? Uh, I really think you should read that book. Now they're saying, I really think you should read this book. It's, there's a, a relationship. So if you tenderly care for this, there will be a period of rebellion, but then it will come back around. My kids, when we come to dinner, we don't at one point they did put their phones down on the table but they don't take their phones out i have to get after my husband sometimes <laughs> having his phone out but they learn they're respectful so um i have i'll try to keep them really fast because we're doing speed rounds one uh, don't just take the place and what i mean by that is if your kids in the car and they're on the phone um you might want to be like put it down um but don't just do that. Um, you know, be like, hey, who are you talking to? What are you talking about? And then if you want to talk to them, say, hey, could you put that down? I want to talk to you about something. Or ask them to put it down because you're inviting them to dinner. Or, hey, could you put that down? We want to do family game time. Like, don't just take replace. And they'll almost always be like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, number two, um, lead with empathy. Um, almost all of us have something that if you were halfway to work and figured out that you left it behind, you would probably turn around for. And maybe it is your phone. Um, and it's, it's a crazy thing, but almost all of us have something that you're like, oh crud, if I left that behind, that I would turn around for that. Maybe it's your wallet. But I had the most surreal thing happen one day when I was on my work because my car drives with my phone. It does not require my a key, and I left my wallet behind one day, and so I get in the car, and on the way to work, I had to stop and get donuts for kids at a meeting, and I walked into QFC, I didn't have my wallet, so I took my phone and I 
tap paid my phone on the QFC thing there and bought my donuts and I walked into the building and I kept doing my life without my wallet because I had my phone. And some of us like might feel the same way. Like you're like, if suddenly you're like, your, your phone was just taken from you, you might, well, that'd be really disruptive. You're like, I have work on that or something. And your kids would feel kind of similar. They're like, well, I have work on that. I have emails on that. I have relationships on that. I connect with this. They can't just give it up any more than we could. So if we think about that as like, I have these things, they have these things, and we lead with that type of empathy, we can use that to help shape them, but that also requires us to be shaped by that same type of conversation too. So we have to lead with that same type of, oh, maybe I need to redirect that too on me. That's good. Don't take, re replace, lead with empathy, like that. Nathan? I think related to that, it, it's important for, for my wife and I just to, to have a plan and to set expectations. I think especially for kids, um, we might wanna connect in the car with our kids and I have wonderful memories of, of some of the best conversations I've ever had with my parents have been in the car, but we can't expect a kid to be able to prioritize that if they have the lure of a screen in front of them. So being able to have those conversations even before I think the event is important um, to talk about when and where and how and why and, and, and what kind of situations might provoke us to want to take the phone for a little bit so that it doesn't feel like a surprise or it feels random, but they're kind of developing the relationship between privileges and responsibilities. Um, so that's that's one, and then I don't know if anybody here or who will watch this has younger kids, but that's, again, more of my life. And um, even though my wife and I really kind of view ourselves primarily as um, tech minimalists as far as our parenting and our kids go, we actually purchased a, our first TV about a year and a half ago. And the reason was because we want to develop wisdom in our kids and not just have um, technology be something that feels exclusive to them or separate from us because we realized that when we were allowing them to watch something, it was on one of our laptops and it was over, you know, to the side and it just felt odd to us that that they were developing this idea that this is something that's for them and we're over here doing our own thing. So what we try to do, um, and I think the TV has helped us do truthfully, is just to have it more of an open space and that's a that's a quality that we want to continue as they get older so that the one day they get a phone it's they haven't built this idea that technology is for them it's private it's their thing but but we share what we're doing just like we would if we were reading a book openly um, our phones our devices are open for us to see because we're family we're community um, and there's that continued you know development of trust that's happening as well great thank you nathan that's great rochelle yeah I think for me, what I have to say is modeling. I think modeling is very powerful. Our children, um, students, look up to adults, look up to all the parents, look up to all the teachers. And I think it has to start with us. It has to start with us adults changing our habits, right? I think it's important for us to be aware and recognize that maybe we are on our phone too much sometimes. I, you know, also have the screen time telling me that, hey, <laughs> like you're using 30% more of your screen than last week. You know, like I think having that type of notification is important, raise awareness, and it makes me want to change my habits. And so I will say just kind of hone into modeling and start with ourselves so then your children will watch you, they respect you, and they, you know, see you as role models. And we'll see if they see changes in you, then I think that will subconsciously change their habits as well. They'll be like, oh, I see my parents talking to me more now. I see that when they're free, my parents are talking to each other or they're calling their friends or they're doing something else, you know, working on their hobbies, all that type of stuff. I think showing them that you can do something else other than being on your phone can be a great first step. That's great, that's great. So I hope you've heard uh, relationships and leaning in and having conversations and actually discussing this with our students and remember that you're the parent and they're still the student. Um, and so I hope you've heard that from everybody from everybody here. Um, I want to thank you all for being willing to sp spend the night and come out and do this and to share a little bit about your personal um, dealings with TechWise and making, making good decisions with your students and your children and then just for your expertise um, up here on the panel. Very grateful for y'all for doing that today, so thanks a lot. Yes, and thank yeah. you, Patrick Ruth. Let's give everyone a hand here. Thank you so much for coming.
Um, I'm going to allow them. We're going to move on real quick. You, it's a long, has been a great night, very informative. They're going to head out to the lobby, and they'll be out there for about 10 minutes. So if you want to come up and have personal, uh, have personal questions or comments, they'll be there. So why don't you guys go ahead and leave, because I have some great resources. I'll go real quick. Um, those who know me, I see a lot of you. I love information, but I have it all spelled out for you, and you'll receive this. Um, this is the, the um, My Tech Wise Life was the lot where we got a lot of the Barna report, so you'll get that in the mail tomorrow. Common Sense Media is fabulous. It's free. Highly recommend that. Um, this other book, Reset Your Child's Brain, was recommended by a parent years ago and to the point where they didn't think the child could um, be able to stay at Bear Creek. And they did this program here, and it just changed. It's about resetting um, your child's brain, and so that's fabulous for those who are interested. And then another popular book. And to be honest, I know what was shared. It is hard with the brain chemistry, and some kids do have addictions. There, I don't ha have the sites, but I did have a, a neighbor that went to different locations to get support on that, and there's nothing to be judgy about. But I think we do need to be wise as parents to understand you know, do they need a little extra help, or is there more going brain chemistry going on as well? Um, this is Access. This is free now. Um, Bear Creek parents um, used to, uh, the school used to have to pay for this. Now it's free to everybody. Definitely go check it out. Smartphones. This is where the conversations happen. This is, you kind of become hip, and you to learn about the new things. They're, a, they're ahead of you. Like, I don't even know what this anima and magna thing is. That must be a new thing. So you can get ahead of it and actually make sense when you have conversations and actually have question, can ask them questions. Um, this came from the Axis. This is very interesting to me. I did not do some fact finding on this. So just so you know, I know we have second grade parents and third grade. We had a police detective that came one time and she said, I do not know why you give your child the World Wide Web at age you know, 10 or 11. And so this is seem, seems really interesting, maybe for transition. Again, I haven't used it, but that might be helpful for you. And finally, um, a lot of you know about the tools for success. We hope you can come to the other ones. The next one is Love and Logic on Teams. Who doesn't need that? And then we have admissions. Um, just so you know, if we have anybody visiting us, um, applications have opened, and um, there's these the deadlines as well. If you are part of a Bear, uh, Bear Creek community, don't worry about it. You, you, it has something called re-enrollment that will happen. You'll get a letter. Um, our director of admissions is out there if you have any questions. This is what's exciting. I got in trouble for how large that is, but you're for free to look at it. We are so blessed by our community and our scholarships and aids and grants. So please, um, if you have time, you can take a look at that and tell your friends. And finally, thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. You all have a great night, and God bless.